Welcome to B2B Marketers on a Mission, a podcast for change makers where we question the conventional, debunk marketing myths, provide actionable tips, think differently, disrupt industries, and take your marketing to a new level. From improving your campaigns to making you a better marketer, these are the inspirational stories that will help us change the way we think and approach B2B marketing one conversation at a time. This podcast is brought to you by I'm Blake Consulting, helping you to stand out in the market and drive revenue to your B2B business. And now your host, Christian Klepp. All right, folks, welcome everyone to this episode of B2B Marketers on a Mission. This is the show where we help you to question the conventional, think differently, disrupt your industry, and take your marketing to new heights. This is your host, Christian Klepp, and today I'm joined by someone on a mission to help B2B SaaS marketers make every dollar go further with copy that converts. So coming to us from Tel Aviv, Israel, Naomi Soman, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show, uh, Naomi, and I'm really looking forward to uh, diving into this conversation because it's a really important one, especially for marketers that have to either contend with copywriting and content marketing. Um, I would say anyone listening to the show, I, I would say that was that would be a nine out of 10, right? <laughs> in, in terms of people that have to deal with that. So um, yeah, if, without further ado, let's dive in. So you've been a professional SaaS copywriter and messaging uh, strategist for some time now. And so just for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna zero in on a topic that I think has become part of your professional uh, mission. And that's how to build the right personas so that you can adapt your messaging across the funnel. I know that sounds like a handful, and it probably is, but it's super important. So let's dive in and start with the following question. Where do you see a lot of B2B SaaS companies fall flat when it comes to both personas and messaging? So I think that the... The reason why SaaS companies usually fall flat is because they're too zeroed in on features and not enough on moments. Um, so SaaS, comp- SaaS products are very complicated. They have a lot of really interesting features. Um, and the initial instinct is for people to say, here are the features that we can offer you. Here's why they're really cool. Come take a look. Come try it. But when it comes to building a persona, you want to think more in terms of moments. You want to think what was going on in their life that led them to search for our solution. Um, So for project management, it's not that they are having a hard time organizing. It's that they have a huge email thread and they can't find the information they need, or they have a spreadsheet with 17 tabs open. And when you shift the conversation from here are the features we have to let's paint a picture of the moments in this person's life that as they go through our marketing funnel, then you can really bring that persona to life in a very colorful way. That's not cheesy or over the top or off brand, um, but is still nuanced and easy to relate to. So you, you feel like you know this person because a persona is a person, a person's life is made up of these very visual, very tangible moments. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So just basically to address the question, you feel that um, none enough SaaS companies are giving this particular aspect um, enough airtime, so to speak. They're not focusing on that um, enough. Is, is, is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Because you have you sort of have two different camps. You have yeah. the sort of traditional campaign marketers, demand gen, user acquisition, and they're more likely to think of a persona as, okay, we are dealing with men between the ages of 25 and 35 with this income level um, and maybe this family situation. And then you have more product marketers who are very, very focused on um, what are the features that people are using? How are they using them? Because they'll go and talk to customers and the customers will say, this is how I use this feature. This is how I use that feature. And that's how they'll build a persona. And neither of those camps really get at 
what a persona is in real life and how do you use it? And more importantly, how do you translate that into copy? Because there's sort of an old adage, no one reads the Wall Street Journal because they have an Ivy League education, a golden retriever, and make six figures, right? Like those are maybe correlated, but there's no causation there. The reason why somebody might read the Wall Street Journal is related to what they are getting out of it and maybe what kind of qualities they associate with the Wall Street Journal. And the same is true for SaaS. Um, people, a middle manager doesn't just buy a project management tool because he needs a solution. He buys a project management solution because there are all of these things going on in his life that are driving him to look for that tool. And if you can, if you can pull out all of those examples, then you can actually write copy that stands up off the page and makes people pay attention um, rather than just getting caught in these buzzwords and getting caught in this jargon. Um, so instead of defaulting, so the, the sort of obvious copywriting examples like improve your ROI or um, save time, save money, um, be more efficient, those are sort of bland. They don't go beyond the surface level. Um, you can, maybe it's, they want to hear, they want to see their publication's name across all, uh, they want to see their company name across all of the top publications. Or maybe they want to hear from their team members, wow, you are one of the best managers that I've ever had. You're so efficient. You really help bring the best out of our team. Um, that really helps people see themselves in your solution, as opposed to just, this is the feature, this is what it does, this is the benefit that you can get out of it. It makes it more like jumping into a story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next question, and I'm sure you'll have no problem answering this one. Talk to us about other pitfalls, right, that marketers should avoid when they're developing personas and messaging. So I would say the main one that I see is not mapping it across the funnel. Um, a lot of times marketers take these golden rules, like show benefits, not features. And the truth is sometimes people need to see benefits and sometimes people need to see features. So when you think about a persona, you have to think about what message are you delivering them right now? Um, if this is very, very top of funnel, maybe it's an ad, maybe it's a blog post, maybe it's a podcast, um, you really want to focus on the benefits of your solution because they haven't really learned all that much. Um, we're sort of in that solution aware stage. But later on, like let's say they're comparing you versus your competitors, you want to zero in on the features because then they're already ready to understand the need of the issue, understand how you really differ from your competitors. Fantastic. No, that's that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. They need to take um, the different stages of the journey, the different stages of the funnel um, into consideration. That's absolutely right. Okay. Um, we talked about this in the uh, pre-interview call, but we, you know, we all know that research and strategy are important. I mean, some people use those two terms very loosely, but um, talk to us about how marketers should use this type of research and strategies to create personas that are actually useful. Um, so I'm not, not naming names, but we don't want to come up with personas like marketing Mary and frustrated Frank, right? I mean, we're way past that now. Yeah, so that's a great question. My favorite way to do this, and I think this is the most efficient way to do this, as opposed to running surveys that might take a long time or trying to find customers that you can interview and hoping that they remember everything. Um, what I do is I go straight to the sales calls. So typically, sales, SaaS companies will have some sort of recording tool, like Gong, for example. If they don't, it's super easy these days to just hit record. So if your SaaS company is not recording calls, ask the BDRs, SDRs, AEs, if they can just hit record on several of their next sales calls and send them over to you when they're done. Um, 
So I say go right into the discovery calls. Typically at the beginning of the sales process, the salespeople will interview the, um, the potential customers, the users to see if they're a good fit. And if they're worth going on to the demo, that's where you're going to find the gold. So listen to those and note down all of their concerns. Um, if you can take the recording and put it into Descript or some sort of transcription tool, then you could even put it through ChatGPT and get all of the examples of the stories that they tell. Um, and you can just write those down. And I take those examples and put them almost word for word into my ad copy or into my landing pages, especially those really great phrases where you're like, wow, what a great way of describing that. I take those, I copy and paste and use them to build more interesting copy. So in a landing page, for, for example, that I wrote recently, instead of saying the word foundational, I heard a user use the word phrase meat and potatoes um, and I took that, copied it, and put it right down there on the landing page. And it sort of sparkled as opposed to the very, as opposed to copy that just fades back into the page. Proprietary award-winning technology and, you know, all that kind of like generic stuff, right? I mean, like the objective of the exercise is to get rid of that and make it more um, customer-centric. And I, and I think what you were saying also there, uh, Naomi was using the customer's language in the copy. Right, mm -hmm. like um, not necessarily like verbatim, but like almost uh, taking what they said and then you know using that as a as an important component in uh, in in crafting copy that will ultimately resonate with them as well. Exactly. If you use the customer's language, they're much more likely to feel that you understand who they are and what they're going for. And we can measure this actually. The more closely we use. Mm -hmm. Um, the language, or the more accurately we use the language of our customers, the more, the better a landing page will perform. And I've seen this work at like $20,000 a month differences, that if you pick the exact word that they're using, and this could be as different as like task manager versus um, task management tool, uh, it can make a huge difference in the performance of the page. This is a concept psychologists call mirroring, sort of reflecting back to customers, the language that they themselves use. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to talk about metrics in a second. But before we do, um, so we've done the research, we've, 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 uh, we've gone through all the uh, due diligence as such. Right? So once marketers have developed these right personas, how can they use these to develop and adapt their messaging across the marketing funnel? And where you can, please provide some examples. Yeah, for sure. Um, so again, I think of it in terms of at what stage are they going to see a specific asset? So typically on an ad, I will focus on the problem um, and I'll sort of hint at the solution, but I'll really double down on if this is the problem you have, then you need to try us. Um, then if you think of in that same in that same funnel, if they click on an ad, they're going to land on a landing page. That's when you can start getting into the solution. And you want to say, these are, this is the solution laid out very basically, and then talk about what it provides and then sort of hint at the product um, and how the product works, some of the details, some of um, the more complex workflows that it, um, that it empowers and and then you can start to think about, okay, if they're hesitating, if they're a little bit concerned, maybe I can give them a little bit of something to get them over that hurdle, reduce the friction. Now, it's not going to be all about reducing friction. It's not going to be all about their doubts, um, but you can sprinkle it throughout the page, like under the CTA. If they're concerned that it's not going to have a specific integration, then you might put that like right underneath the CTA. Or if they're concerned that they're not going to be able to figure out how the software works, you can advertise your knowledge base or talk about the customer service and make sure to put that at the bottom of the page. So if they're concerned, which you'll find out if you listen to a lot of these sales calls and these discovery calls, you can include that on the page. Um, and then you can, you can bake that into 
your social posts. A lot of people are getting in really into organic social media, social selling. Um, this is a really great tip. Ask the customer service team, ask the sales team, what are people concerned about? Spin each of those into a social post. So you're advertising this even further up the funnel so they can get over their concerns so they can have their questions answered before they even talk to a salesperson. Um, so I would say that when you're thinking about creating these personas, first to think of it in terms of when are they going to see this in the funnel, the earlier on in the funnel, the more you want to focus on problems, the later on in the funnel, the more you want to focus on solutions. And then even further down, you want to talk about overcoming people's doubts and concerns. Um, and if you're doing more organic content, um, more podcasts, blog posts, social posts, um, then you can create content around each one of these persona areas um, so that you are giving people as much information as possible in the earlier stages of the funnel. Fantastic, fantastic. No, those are some great insights. Um, I had a follow-up question for you on the topic of reducing uh, friction uh, across the different stages of the, of the funnel, Naomi. Would you say that it would be helpful, I mean, besides the points that you've just raised, would it be helpful also to include an FAQ section, um, either on the product page or on the solutions page? And, you know, going back to what you mentioned a couple of minutes ago about, like, listening to sales calls, right? Um, and listening to those recordings and taking down or observing uh, those genuine challenges or questions or even objections, right, that, that potential customers have. Would it then make sense to also like incorporate those insights into an FAQ section and that way you can already address some of these uh, these issues or these questions that they have up front and that will that will also save perhaps in future the sales on um, the, the trouble of answering these in discovery calls? Yeah, 100%. I think that on product pages specifically, like on the website, FAQ, that's where you want to put those FAQs. I would say on a landing page, if it's um, a Google campaign, a LinkedIn campaign, a long FAQ section might bog down the page. It might, you might be giving them too much information right away. They don't need all of that information. They're not ready to digest it yet. Um, but on a website where they have the time, they're really considering what the product is about and whether it's worth the investment, 100% FAQs are great. And again, pull those from the sales calls, like take them directly from the customer's mouth. Okay, great. Um, so that was the first question. Uh, the second question is, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, social proof to help reduce friction? That's a great question. I think social proof is great. However, in today's climate, people are so savvy that they are not trusting social proof the mm -hmm. way they were at one point. So I use social proof very strategically. I don't flood the page with social proof. I pick out the best social proof that I can find, the best testimonial, the best ROI, the best statistics, the best case study, the best logo, customer logos, and I'll put them on the page. Um, I'll make sure that they are tr as trustworthy as possible, include an image, include the person's job title, um, include the company's logo, show that you have actually worked with the person, they are a real person, um, and you, so that's number one, make sure they're very reliable, pick social proof strategically. Number two, I would say choose social proof that proves the point you're trying to make. So if you're trying to prove that the solution can improve ROI, choose social proof that proves that point, not just any social proof, because people get excited about social proof and they just put it all on there. No, be strategic about what it is you are trying to convince your users of. Um, and then third, I would say try to choose a few different kinds of social proof. So company logos is a good example, maybe G2 badges or um, stars from, uh, or um, Captera badges or Captera reviews, um, and maybe a testimonial, maybe you have a Forrester report that you did on you and th that they did on you and you have some statistics that you can pull. If you have a, people make decisions in different ways. So you wanna have a few different kinds of social proof depending on 
what they need to take that next step. What what kind of angle is going to convince them? That was such a fantastic answer, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's well, what I'm taking away from from this is uh, be strategic, um, but also be intentional in terms of like what are you trying to tell people through the testimonials, through this type of social proof, beyond trying to like glorify yourself, right? Because how often, how often do you go to websites where you see the same testimonial sprinkled throughout the website, even in sections where it might not necessarily make sense? Or, okay, it's the same social proof on <clears throat> the pages of different like products or different services. So is this company like using all of these products, right? It makes you want to step back and think about that, right? Or my favorite one is like all the um, the clutch badges, right? Or, or whichever uh, review platform you have, right? And then that, that, that also is sprinkled throughout the website. And you're absolutely right. I think, um, I think the reality is to be strategic and be intentional about it. But that also requires quite a bit of thinking on the part of whoever is um, uh, putting together all of this copy. Right, and putting together the website. Right, for for instance, if this person had, um, you know, gave the company a testimonial about, okay, they had this challenge, and then this is how the company helped them overcome it, and then they put it in a section of the website where that testimonial may not necessarily make sense. That would make you, as the potential visitor to this website, um, either have doubts about how genuine this testimonial actually is, or um, think, okay, well. This company is just singing its, you know, uh, its own praises here. So it doesn't necessarily. So there's no correlation between between the social proof and what's on the what's on the page itself, right? A hundred percent. And on top of that, you may actually convince the user that your solution is not intended for their demographic. So I've heard users go through pages through um, sort of user testing, and the company put like the um, the biggest logos that they had. So like Coca-Cola and um, Mattel and all of these huge, huge enterprise names. Um, and actually the page was intended for small businesses. So people were like, you know, maybe this is not for us. Maybe this is too expensive. And they didn't even look at the pricing yet, but they were like, maybe this is just too robust for us. We need something a little bit smaller. And a lot of SaaS companies can cater both to small and medium businesses and to enterprise um, corporations. So you want to make sure that the social proof that you're using is speaking to the person you're talking to. And most of the time, if you're setting up a campaign, you know who that person is, you know what size company they work at. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Naomi, we get to the part in the show where we talk about actionable tips. And now, look, you've been doing this for a while, you understand that copywriting, especially copywriting that delivers results, it's a process, right? This isn't a button that you push or an AI tool that you use and bam, it gives you this like award-winning copy, right? Mm -hmm. But if somebody were listening to this conversation that you and I are having who is um, uh, struggling with these challenges that we've been talking about, what are some of the things that you'd like them to take away uh, from this discussion? So walk us through that process of what marketers can do to develop the right personas and adapt their messaging. Yeah, 100%. I think I alluded to this before, but I'll say it again because I have found this so, so, so helpful. Um, get your sales team to record their calls. Then listen to those discovery calls. They're usually not more than 20 minutes. And you can even take the transcription and, or you can take the recording, turn it into a transcript and catch out GBT to do this. But find the, find three pieces of information and write them down. Find all of the examples of the times where they were struggling with a problem. Find how they described their ideal situation, what they were looking to get to, and what their concerns were. And copy it down word for word. Then when you're writing something, go back to that. I create like a dashboard or a spreadsheet for myself with all of these examples. Go back to that, copy and paste it, into whatever copy you're writing. If you're writing ad copy, if you're writing a headline, if you're writing the title for a blog, if you are writing landing page copy, web page copy, whatever it is, it's always relevant. 
take the customer's words, copy and paste them onto the page, and then write around it to round it out. And if you can do that over and over again, you'll start to think and sound like your customer. It's super easy. It doesn't take long. And if you spend an hour or two just listening to these calls and copying and pasting what they say, then you can use that over and over and over again for at least as long as your product is and your market is functioning the same way. Fantastic, fantastic. You know what? <clears throat> I don't know what your experience has been, but it blows my mind how many marketers don't do that. Um, how many marketers don't actually listen to the sales calls or get recordings uh, from sales? And there may or may not be friction between those two departments. And I suppose that's a topic uh, for another podcast interview. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's so important, right? It's so important to listen to those uh, conversations between the sales and the potential customer or the prospect and to to listen to, I, I, I think one part of the spectrum is listening to the questions and the objections and the concerns. But the other one is also listening to how the sales address each of them. A hundred percent. And if you want like an extra golden nugget, mm -hmm. go to the customer success team. Everyone always goes to the sales team. Sometimes yeah. customer success gets forgotten. Mm -hmm. They, because they work with these clients on an ongoing basis. So they know all of the good stuff mm -hmm. and they know what success looks like and what success doesn't look like. So you can get some gold if you go over to the customer success team and they'll love talking to you. People don't ask for their opinion nearly as much as they should. Um, but ask them what their yeah. opinions are, what clients want, what clients don't want. That's Absolutely. a, a goldmine of information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I'm moving us on to the love it or hate it question around metrics, right? So, I mean, at some point, and you pro this probably happens to you more times than you care to remember, but like um, at some point, you're going to have to prove that what you're doing is working or you have to show some kind of indication of progress, as I always like to say. So what are some metrics? And just give us some top level ones that marketers should be paying attention to, um, especially when they're creating the right personas and developing that respective messaging across the funnel. Yeah, 100%. Focus on the basics. Conversion rate. Do people click? Do people sign up for or click through rate and conversion rate? Do people click on what on the ad that you're promoting or the podcast you're promoting or the white paper you're promoting? Do they convert? Do they read the white paper? Do they read the blog? Um, do they click onto the landing page? And do they sign up for a demo? Uh, start with that. Those are the basics. If people are clicking, they like what they see. Um, if people are signing up, then you're giving them the information that they need to, to get there. There's a lot of others that we could talk about, but I would say that if you're just starting out, that's a really good place to start. And um, I, I think once you have the basics in place and you have traffic coming in, then you can start to think more seriously about quality, like what quality leads are these? Um, and people measure that in different ways. Sometimes you measure it in CAC, sometimes cost per lead. Um, sometimes whether it's an MQL versus an SQL versus an opportunity. And I would say that those are all good things to focus on. Once you have a lot of people coming in through the funnel, say, what quality are these leads? But just to start with, are people clicking? Are people signing up? And if you're testing a lot of different forms of copy and you're seeing where the clicks are, you'll learn very quickly whether the persona that you've created is accurate or not. Absolutely, absolutely. You know what, metrics is one of those um, topics where people tend to go down this really deep, 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 deep rabbit hole, right? But especially if you're starting out, uh, you're absolutely right. Like, start with uh, keeping it simple is one thing, but like, find the most important components or metrics, you know, as attributes that you want to measure, I think was your point, right? Start with those and then build from there. Right, because if you start out with like, okay, we've got forty things to measure, it's like, oof, right, so um, overwhelming. Yeah, a hundred percent. Don't yeah. don't let don't drown in a sea of of numbers. Um, don't go down a rabbit hole in Tableau. Are yeah. people clicking? Are they signing up? That'll give you at least sixty five percent of the story. Uh, and if you're focusing on copy, um, that's mostly that that's enough to to get yeah. you. Yep. Yep. Data. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Naomi, please <clears throat> get up on your soapbox. 
<laughs> what is a status quo in your area of expertise that you passionately disagree with and why? So I think there is a common belief among a lot of marketers, especially more brand marketers, that copywriting is super creative. It's a business form of poetry. It's a form of self-expression. And I really, really passionately disagree with that. I'm a very creative person and I love bringing creativity into my work. But I think ultimately creative copywriting, excuse me, is about figuring out exactly what the customers need and putting it on the page in a way that they can easily digest. And a lot of that information comes from the customer's mouths. And the other half of that information comes from understanding the data and knowing what message people need to hear at what point. Are they at the top of the funnel? Are they at the bottom of the funnel? Um, are you targeting small leads? Are you targeting large leads? Are you focusing on quantity? Are you focusing on quality? Because copywriting is really, really simple and really strategic and can be very scientific and reliable if you can follow this path. Um, and I think that creativity has its place, but a lot of times it's just not a super reliable way of building a marketing engine. And if you're spending 30, 40, $50,000 a month, you can't just rely on creativity. You have to have a proven process. That's a fair point. But um, let me ask you this. Would you agree that you would need a certain level of creativity to have that differentiation as well? I mean, surely you can get that also from analyzing the data and uh, addressing the problems of the of the customers. But would you would you agree that you need a little bit of creativity there as well? I think that there's definitely room for creativity, especially mm -hmm. in um, some of the words that you use to, ex to express things. Sure. Um, or the scenarios maybe that you choose, but I think that it's overstated in the industry, okay. that people believe it's the be-all, end-all, and I think that it takes a smaller role than people think. Okay. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Okay. Naomi, here comes the bonus question. All right. Get ready for it. Rumor has it that you're quite the salsa dancer. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody whispered that in my ear, so I'm just I'm just passing the message on, right? So if you had the opportunity to dance salsa anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? I've always wanted to go to Cuba mm -hmm. and dance salsa in Havana because um, there are two different kinds. There are a couple of different kinds of, of salsa, and my favorite kind is Cuban salsa. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how popular it is there today, but in yeah. my imagination, they're just dancing in the streets all of the time. Okay. Um, so I would <laughs> like love a, to go there and verify like in the, that. Like in the Havana Club commercial? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I, I'm curious because now that you brought it up, what's the difference between Cuban salsa and the, the rest? So Cuban salsa is, it has more of an African flavor to it. It has... Right. Um, a it has more of an African beat to it. It's mm -hmm. also the um for example, LA style salsa goes right. in a straight line. You okay. keep the same line where right. Cuban salsa often goes in a circle. Um, mm. And there's also a counterpart to Cuban salsa called Rueda, which is okay. done in a group. Um, okay. So everyone, there's like a, a series of couples in a circle and they mm -hmm. all dance together and there's somebody who calls out the moves and everyone does it at the same time, which is also very cool. Interesting. Interesting. You know, if this wasn't a video call, I would have asked you for an actual demonstration, but, you know, in the interest of time, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just have to take your word for it. I mean, like you, you've... <laughs> You've gone to great lengths now to describe it in great detail. So I just have to use my imagination to like figure out, okay, well, that's the difference between A and B. <laughs> um, but yeah, Naomi, uh, thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. And I really do hope the listeners uh, walk away with, um, you know, from this uh, conversation with some actionable uh, tips. Right? Um, so thanks again for your time. Quick introduction to yourself and how folks out there can get in touch with you. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, my name is Naomi Soman. You can find me on LinkedIn. 
um, or via my website is storylogic.com. That's S-T-O-R-Y-L-O-G-I-C-K.com. Um, yeah, feel free to get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, fantastic. Naomi, once again, thanks so much for your time. Take care, stay safe, and talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye for now.